So hello and, and welcome everybody uh, to our second Ask Me Forum. We had our first one uh, last Wednesday with, uh, with Peter Bevan Baker, Hannah Bell, Trish Altas, and Michelle Beaton. And uh, today we are joined by the other half of the caucus. Uh, so we've got uh, Lynn Lund. Uh, she is our deputy leader and uh, also our shadow critic for environment, water, and climate change, and for green economic development. Uh, we have uh, Steve Howard, who is our critic for uh, transportation, infrastructure, and energy, as well as for justice and public safety. Uh, Carla Bernard is our critic for education and lifelong learning and for the status of women. And Ola Hammerland is our critic for uh, tourism and culture, and he's also our uh, net zero critic in the opposition caucus. And so uh, welcome everybody. I'm so glad that you could make it here. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we begin. Um, I'll just ask that uh, if you're uh, not, uh, you know, speaking to please uh, mute your, uh, your mic just in case, you know, something barks in your background or something like that so it doesn't send us all into shock. Um, and we have, uh, we have a lot of, a lot of questions have been submitted uh, in advance uh, to this meeting. Um, probably like actually definitely more than we'll be able to get through all in one, um, one hour here that we've got. Although um, I'm gonna encourage you to, to send your questions along uh, if, if you have uh, additional questions, feel free to use the, the chat to uh, indicate that you have a question and, and uh, preferably the, uh, if you could indicate the topic of what your question is as well. And I can call on you to ask your question. And um, since there, there are definitely uh, some questions that we're not gonna get to live right now, um, what I'm going to do is, uh, is make sure to prioritize questions that fall within the portfolios of the MLAs that we have online right now. And for the questions we don't get around to, uh, cause we really want to get you answers. Um, I think we can work with the MLAs to uh, help you get some questions, um, you know, either in, in writing or in some other way. So we'll, we'll make sure that you get your questions all answered. Um, I'm going to type right now in the chat just so that uh, you can see where it is. If you're not already in the chat, then you should see a orange thing probably lighting up somewhere on your controls and that will indicate where you can get access to the chat. Okay, and uh, are you on a Zoom thing? Sorry, I'm uh, somebody needs to be muted. <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to uh, check through here and do some muting. I have some, I have superpowers to be able to mute people as well. Um, okay, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so I just uh, typed in into the chat there. So if you want, feel free to uh, uh, introduce yourself in the chat uh, right now. Let us know where you're tuning in from. It'd be good to see where, where in the island everybody is. I am joining you from beautiful Montague, Prince Edward Island myself. And I know that, uh, Carla is in uh, Charlottetown. Steve uh, is in uh, Summerside. Uh, Lynn is in uh, Clinton. And uh, Ola is in Charlottetown as well. So I'm going to start off by uh, asking each of the MLAs to just tell us a, just a brief um, highlight for them from the last uh, legislative uh, sitting that we just had, that just ended on December 2nd, the fall sitting. Um, can we begin with, with you, Lynn? Can you just share with us what really stood out or, or you think was most important for you? Yeah, I'm going to give you two uh, quickly. I'll make it really fast. The first one for me personally was getting my net zero carbon bill through. I had been working on it for a long time, so having that come to fruition made me really happy. But the other big highlight for me was actually seeing how incredibly comfortable all of our caucus has gotten. I was quite impressed with our team. So that meant a lot to me. Okay, thank you very much, Lynn. Um, Ola, would you like to uh, give us your highlights? Oh, are you sure. muted there? Oh, there I you are. I think I'm muted in. Um, I go back a little bit further, actually. I think uh, I have to go back to one of the sessions 
when the, our very first Green Caucus session started, it was really a revelation to me. Uh, Lynn's, uh, I can't even remember if it was a bill or a motion, but uh, to change the climate goals of PEI just showed me the whole range of political stuff happening out there, including the, uh, including the getting the public involved and getting their support, which was very critical in the final approval of the, uh, of the thing, which inspired me to do a motion called Net Zero Now, which was kind of a logical c consequence of that. Um, it isn't enough to have goals, you have to actually do some action, which I'm, I'm a strong believer in that. And uh, that didn't go as fast. It uh, took uh, a long time. It, it wasn't until the next session that it actually got passed. And even so, it was muted down quite a bit. But then the government just recently announced that they're taking in everything net zero, making uh, what you could almost be believe as impossible goals. Uh, I, uh, much as I like the fact that they at least embrace the words, uh, I'm really worried about uh, promises that don't go anywhere. So uh, that's one of the reasons I voted against the, I didn't vote against, I'm sorry, that I abstained from voting on the budget in a protest. Um, but other things move along, uh, like for instance, uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, constituent mentioned to me <coughs> that he wanted uh, shingles vaccine to be paid for by the government. And mm -hmm. uh, I brought it up to Trish and she uh, maybe already had been working on a motion which she presented in government and it passed. That's very unusual, but also very encouraging to see things actually passing that fast. Yeah, I'm that's. Forward, I'm looking looking more to more forward to more of that stuff. Yeah, that that Thanks. was awesome. That's a big win win for a lot of uh, a lot of seniors. Um, so I know that can be an expensive vaccine. Uh, let's go over to to you, Carla. Uh, what was uh, what stood out for you as a highlight from the last session? Oh, it's hard to pick one. And then my old memory is trying to jog through everything. Um, I think for me, um, kind of jumping off what Lynn said, I really felt um, that we pulled together as a team. And when you're working together in the legislature and you're trying to respond to answers that you're getting from ministers and you're kind of pivoting on the spot and um, taking time to realize, you know, hey, I only have three questions, but I really would like another one and, and everyone really having each other's back in a really genuine, awesome way. Um, that was certainly a highlight um, for me. And also when the, um, the, the special committee on poverty presented their, their uh, report and, you know, just some of the topics being like universal basic income, uh, really hoping that we go with with a full implementation. Um, so you know, there's there's positive and negatives there, but also another thing too is just the fact that uh, I really feel like our caucus is bringing things in the legislature that may not have been there before. You know, things like period poverty and and uh, and homelessness, addiction to the extent that has been there, and mental health. So I think just uh, really bringing things to the forefront and really being advocates for for those things. And uh, yeah, I guess that's me. Great, thanks Carla. And Steve, what was uh, important for you? Oh, well, uh, a lot of what this, uh, what's important to me is is all of the wonderful things that were getting done. But personally, one of the, the, the most interesting points just on a personal level, was in the very last day, I had a line of questions on the plebiscite for the premier, and he was very responsive and open to uh, changing our electoral system. So see where that goes. But uh, I thought I'd plant those seeds, and they seem to have uh, at least gone into the ground. So that was very, <laughs> that was very interesting. That's very encouraging. Great. I know there's a, there's a question uh, coming up on that uh, later on. So, um, so let's, let's dive right into the questions. Um, so the, the first question actually, and probably not surprising given that uh, 
that most of the MLAs here have been working directly on the climate change file. Uh, this mm -hmm. comes from David Woodbury, wondering how can we goad the government into initiating action now to battle climate change? He says, fiddling with goals 10 or 20 years out is useless. Who would like to go on that, Steve? <laughs> uh, well, I, I would just say this to you, David. I, I agree that uh, just always setting goal, targets and goals and talking into the future is useless, but uh, we do need to have some sort of framework in place. And so what, what Lynn has gotten forward here is something that's, uh, uh, well, it's, it's not your typical, just we're gonna get there by this. It, it, it's got accountability built into it, but that's not what I wanted to talk about. I've got two bills in development, uh, David, that have to do with changing around our, the, the fundamental systemic way we use electricity on PEI energy rate structure and um, the minimum purchase price for renewables. Uh, it sounds like a good thing at first that, hey, we're going to have these renewables and they're going to pay at least this much um, for the power, but the only beneficiary of that is government and they're using it as a hidden tax and using the rate system to do it. So it's coming off the backs of everyone instead of through our tax system where you can take from the rich and not take from the poor, for instance. So those are some yeah, removing the barriers to access to cheap renewables is going to get huge community and public buy-in and uh, having a rate structure that actually encourages us to move in the directions that we want to go is going to do the same thing. So it's those kind of fundamental, like let's get the, the hitch out of the get up so that the machine can start moving in the direction that let, let's use consumerism and, and the free market uh, to our benefit. So those are, those are in the works. They got delayed on me, David, because I suddenly uh, found out I was having another child and ended up uh, hiding up up west for most of the summer. So I didn't get as much work done on it as I'd like, but uh, we'll see. I'm hoping they'll come forward in February. Thanks, Steve. Uh, anybody else want to take a crack at that? I know, Lynn, you've been uh, doing I a lot of work in your capacity as chair of the Special Committee on Climate Change. Yes, I definitely want to talk to that. And I agree with what Steve has said. I think that having goals and a framework are important. I think that some of the components of the piece of legislation we got passed that didn't get a lot of media attention or even scrutiny from other MLAs yeah, revolve around the uh, language of inclusive economy, of sustainable development goals. There's all kinds of criteria for the government to come forward with sustainable development plans now. Um, it defines what sustainable development is with a Mi'kmaq word, netagumalek, which means essentially the use of resources without interfering with future capacity of others to use those resources to meet their needs. There are a lot of active components of it that didn't get a whole lot of attention, but one source of frustration that I would say both Steve and I have felt is not being able to prescribe how government spends money. So both Steve and I have lots of ideas of things that government could be doing to take direct action currently, and we talk about it all the time, but in our capacity, it's just not something we can, we can direct. We cannot have legislation that tells government what kind of programs to create. So that's where the work of the Special Committee on Climate Change has been particularly interesting for both of us. I know Steve is really well informed on a number of interesting projects that have happened in other places like um, vehicle to grid technology. So he was able to suggest that we bring in experts in that, particularly I think it was Dr. William Willett Kempton. Steve can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But we brought him in to speak to us on it and we got all kinds of great ideas coming forward from that committee. We strongly believe we will be able to make final recommendations soon. And that's where we can make suggestions on tangible, immediate steps that government can be taking. And we also were talking about in the possibility of including things like electric vehicle subsidies in our budget submission, for, for example. So there are a number of areas where the rubber hits the road that we are definitely paying. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Lynn. Um, so I'm going to go over to uh, a question now, actually, um, from from Rita Jackson. Uh, she was asking about something that you touched on earlier, Ola, which was about why can't we require net zero or as close to net zero construction as possible for all new buildings? And uh, were, were you saying earlier that the government has now pledged to basically make all government buildings net zero from now on, just like your motion had called for? 
Well, they have sort of. Uh, it's it's kind of a promise. Uh, promises seems to be what governments just love to make, including the federal government that's like uh, keep promising carbon taxes and stuff like that. Uh, but not now, sometime out in the future. I think 23 is what Trudeau's finally going to do something about it. Uh, he has been in power now for eight years. Uh, it's similar with the, uh, with the current government. They, uh, they are doing a couple of schools net zero, but to make the whole island net zero, obviously it does, needs to be a lot more than a couple of buildings and they should make a flying start and uh, seriously consider how we make all new buildings net zero right now or as soon as possible, like next year, not sometime way in the future. It's Do you know of any other jurisdictions that have uh, done that uh, so far, mm -hmm. Ola? Required new buildings to be net zero? I, I have been looking. I believe there are some municipalities in Europe that, that as of 2020 or 2021 will mm -hmm. require all new buildings oh. to be either passive or um, net zero, but I haven't located them yet. I'm looking for them still. Okay. Um, but the thing about net zero, it, uh, which is quite wonderful, it they pay for themselves. You don't need to ruin the budget and reduce social housing or what have you to build net zero. You, you uh, can take out an extra loan to pay for the extra net zero features and they will be all paid for by the savings um, and uh, energy collected by the net zero features. Mm -hmm. There's not almost no other government project that pays for itself. Net zero yeah. does. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Ola. Um, I'm going to go over to a question now from uh, Murray Salas. And I think this one uh, falls into your wheelhouse, uh, Carla. So he's asking, when will this province wake up to the fact that more trained social workers are needed to assist families experiencing problems with raising teens? Since there are not enough trained and sensitive workers to assist these families, the tendency is to see these matters turned over to criminal courts to sort out. This is unnecessarily tough on families and wasteful of court resources. Um, I know that uh, it's, it's not uh, exactly your portfolio, but you've done a lot of work in, in areas like this, Carla. Do you um, have anything that you can say about, uh, about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. The default is to turn it over to the criminal system. And we tend to do that with a lot of our, a lot of our different um, departments tend to default to justice. And if we took care of them properly, and one example being offering counseling services to anyone who wants or needs them, we'd see a ripple effect in savings and in the health of our citizens. And when I say savings, I mean government spending throughout all departments, right? If we look at the social determinants of health, that's, that absolutely makes sense. And, and you touched on a really good point there, and that being the lack of professionals, mental health professionals. And it's not just in social work, right? It's, it's in any sort of mental health capacity, well, any sort of health capacity, not just mental health. And so there, there are some ways around that. And right now there is, um, there is a, uh, the Regulated Health Professions Act, which is still sitting. I, I thought it, was, it would have been done by now, but government keeps saying it's coming up and it doesn't. Um, with, and so that's where uh, bodies of professional uh, like counselors, for example. So you would get regulated in order to protect people accessing services, you would be regulated and able to offer services through healthcare plans, which we don't have now. So making counseling more accessible to people. Right now, what, you know, if someone were to come to me and ask me what to do if they were having problems with, um, with teenagers and, and needing some support, which is, you know, very common, um, I would suggest going to your school counselor. There are the student well-being teams in the school system while they are running at capacity. I say all of these things with a full awareness that all of these systems and all of these programs and services are operating at capacity or above right now. Um, but we do have the student well-being teams who can refer uh, families to Triple P Parenting, um, 
there's another one, positive parenting from two homes, just depending on your, on your situation, there are programs available. And I, you're absolutely right. We do have a mental health professional shortage. And, and one of the things that, that I'm, I'm really right now working a lot on, which is, doesn't really fall under my portfolio, but at the same time it does, is access to justice. And, and you know what, it came at me originally in the form of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. And now we're seeing it kind of translate into the whole family. And so even, even children, the Children's Law Act just passed, um, which was a huge piece of legislation the government brought forward. And if we are true to that, if we connect it to all the proper programs and services, it will be quite transformational for us on the island. I can give you more details about that on the side if you're interested. And one of the things that people are advocating for is um, man, like counseling. People want it to be mandated. I, I don't know if we need to mandate, but just to make the access much easier for anyone um, requiring those mental health services, because we know, you know, the 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 statistics for our children too. You know, one in five of our children are have been abused. And so all of that trauma is in our school system. So I, I always, I know you were asking about 16 year olds, but you know, we have such a unique opportunity to catch these things in our children in the school system. And so I think that we need to be looking at the way we deliver mental health services on PEI. And um, that is something that is constantly on my mind. So I'm happy to have a discussion over coffee, over Zoom, anytime about that. I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much, Carla. And uh, yeah, I see Murray is is here on the call with us. So if uh, if you have any follow ups to that, Murray, um, feel free to uh, write in the chat or anything like that. Um, and uh, we've had a few questions. I'm going to go back to uh, Steve Howard. I think on this, uh, there were a number of people interested in electric vehicles, <laughs> different aspects of what. Why aren't we? Um, providing incentives for electric vehicles, you know, um, what, isn't can't the government fleet be um, transitioned to to government vehicle or to electric vehicles? So I'm wondering, Steve, can you can you tell us what you know about what's going on with electric vehicle, uh, you know, incentives and <laughs> and fleet switchovers and stuff in the province right now? Uh, it's been a pretty disappointing two years in that regard, I'll tell you, because I, ever since I got there, I've been pushing for, for just exactly that. I mean, we have a Department of Environment that spends something like 10 or $15 million a year of our funds that are supposed to be used to reduce carbon or do, for environmental purposes, and they're subsidizing uh, propane use, and they're subsidizing burning wood and burning wood pellets and all sorts of things. And then we've got a carbon price that uh, is subsidizing the use of gasoline, and we take it off and we put it back on. We, the uh, Special Committee on Climate Change, one of the recommendations that came forward is that we no longer invest in any sort of energy system that's not carbon neutral within a, a useful time frame. So to hit our 2030 targets, which wood biomass is not, yet we continue to spend money on it. So anytime I've questioned the Minister of Environment or the Minister of Transportation on why we don't have any electric vehicle incentives yet, we kind of get the, well, we're working on it answer. It's, it's been quite a while of working on it. Uh, so recently, the Special Committee on Climate Change um, came out with a, a recommendation saying, let's set a, make sure that we set aside some significant funding because we're going to be coming out with strong recommendations on the electric vehicle incentive front. So that's that's one good thing. Finally, some, some progress in there. We didn't want to let another budget slip by without that recommendation, at least having some sort of monetary placeholder there. And uh, as far as fleet electrification. I have no idea why we're not buying more electric vehicles for our government fleet. I've been pressing that as well, but we've got, I think the numbers were 14 electric vehicles or, or hybrids in the fleet total now. We mm. bought, I think, two more last year. So that the rate of that happening is far too slow. We're electrifying our bus fleet though, so that's, that's a big yeah. plus. But as far as the government light vehicle fleet, been a very frustrating go at it for me. <laughs> I, Do you know how big the uh, the government light vehicle fleet is? Uh, over oh. 300 vehicles. Yeah. So and so, so a... far last year we we replaced two. Okay. So, <laughs> so a long ways to go pace. there. Pick up that pace. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Yes, and if I can just add one quick sure. thing to, if I may. 
Steve has been pushing hard on this. He really has to the point of driving some of those ministers a little foolish. It's been great. But um, one question we were asking during the budget on this is when they are giving us excuses like there's just simply not enough electric vehicles to bring all of these in and trans transition the entire fleet. Now, I think to Steve's point, it's arguable that they could be bringing in more than two. But uh, the other question we asked is, has there been any assessment done on how many of the people who are driving giant trucks and F-150s actually require trucks? Because even if they can't transition to electric, they can certainly be using more reasonable fuel efficient vehicles. They're not all obligated to use F-150s to drive around Charlottetown all day. So that's the other thing that we were asking them to bring back information on to do an assessment of the fleet and how many people could reasonably using could reasonably be using smaller vehicles. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just a, a follow up on that, I see uh, Barbara Dilla raised the uh, the point that electric bicycles uh, in a lot of cases could actually be uh, superior to uh, to electric vehicles from a sustainability transport uh, standpoint in urban areas and. Uh, did you guys re recommend electric bicycle subsidies as well, or is it uh, would that fall under just vehicles in general, or what's your? <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. You take the first crack at it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, just one of the things I I had put as my priorities for this session that just passed was uh, electric bicycles and ensuring that the uh, the regulations and and whatnot allowed them to happen. So. I have been back and forth with the, the uh, Department of Transportation on that, and they are having a look at those regulations as they stand. Uh, it was disappointing to hear the, in the initial conversation, they kind of were looking at other jurisdictions that have treated anything below 32 kilometers an hour or capable of going 32 kilometers an hour. That was a, a bicycle, anything above that was a motorcycle essentially. Um, and I was um, trying to get those kind of regulations brought to Prince Edward Island. but those other jurisdictions, there's starting to be some pushback. And they were, the, the word that the, uh, the policy fellow I was dealing with uh, from government kept using was liquor sickles. So people that couldn't have a license would hop on these things and get on the highway and be zooming around and were, were quite a danger to everyone. So mm. there, there was, and, and recently they had won a, a court case against someone who had lost his license on PEI, gone to, I think, Walmart or wherever and gotten a something that he could get, hop on the highway and get down the highway in an electric bicycle and he, he caused an accident and they won that court case calling that that vehicle he was on a motorized vehicle so there's now been that precedent set within our justice system so there's that complication and I'm trying to work through that now to make sure that electric bicycles aren't somehow lumped together as uh, motorized vehicles so that you need a license and you need all this extra extra things to go along with it yeah. So that's so that's where I'm at currently with electric bicycles. Um, incentives would be the next step after that of making sure that they don't outright get uh, banned in some way, shape, or form, or greatly affected. Okay. Well, thanks for your work on that, Steve. Um, Carla, I'm uh, going to go back to you. We've got a question here um, asking what happened and what is going to happen now with your bill to reduce the voting age in uh, to 16 in PEI. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, we tried to get government, they, government put in a motion uh, saying that, uh, you know, to do, they wanted to bring it to standing committee and they wanted to bring in a bunch of different organizations. They listed a bunch of organizations to come in. And it, it's a little bit tricky as it is kind of a rights-based piece of legislation. And so therefore it's not it's not it's not something that you consultations are you know yes or no do you agree or not agree it, it's um it's a lot more like how does it impact your work and and what are some things that we need to consider in 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 this and so what we've decided to do with that because government didn't bring forward the motion we've decided that we will do based on you know we'll use the starting point as the list of people to consult um, from the motion that was submitted by government and then we'll we'll add to it and um, and frame our own. So where we are right now is kind of framing the messaging. What is it that we want? How are we going to ask the question? And and um, how we're going about it? So we're really hoping to bring it forward again in February. Um, just we just want to make sure that 
you know, that we, we do things properly. So it has the support. Um, and, uh, so that's where we are right now. I actually have, have a couple, a little bit of talking to do with, with caucuses. Um, I don't know if anyone was, was watching when, when we were, when we brought that to the floor and Oliver Batchelder, he's a 17 year old. He came to the floor as, as an expert and, and he always offers really good insight. And so he threw a curveball at me. So we're going to, we're going to talk about it a little more, but that's, that's the plan so far. And we, we are going to bring it forward again. Uh, we just have a little bit of work to do before that. Okay. Thank you for that, Carla. Okay. I'm going to move over to um, a question here from Trevor Billard. And, and he's basically wondering um, what the government uh, is going to do to help find workers. So he's saying that he's experiencing um, problems with, with people who are uh, maybe re have been receiving um, COVID related benefits that, uh, that maybe provide a disincentive to work. Um, and that there are a lot of companies out there that need workers, but that can't find anyone. And so, uh, so basically, there, Trevor is wondering, you know, what can be done to to help fill that gap. Um, anybody want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I can talk to that a little bit. Thank you for the question. It's an interesting balance, isn't it? Because we hear from people who feel incredibly concerned on one side about going to work, especially if they have vulnerable family members or if they themselves are in a higher risk category. And then we hear from people whose industries are booming, such as the construction industry that's really struggling to find skilled workers to fill those gaps. It's definitely a uh, nuanced discussion. I would say that the incentives, of course, are federal, so we don't have a lot to do with that side of it, but we have definitely, this was something I brought up in question period, what are we doing to help transition people who may have lost work or lost the amount of work that they need? As it is, if we're going to meet the targets that we have recently brought forward, we are going to need a lot more people being trained in our trades. Uh, Steve Howard and I have talked about this quite a bit. We simply don't have enough trades people to fill the gaps that exist now, let alone these massive amounts of new jobs that are gonna be coming forward in order to make this transition to a clean economy. So we have been grilling on creating programs, creating opportunities to upskill or reskill people so that we can fill those gaps. There are examples in other jurisdictions of provinces that um, create bridging programs that allow people to create the skills that they need and just complete those bits of training so that they can move into those spaces. But another part of it, in some industries, I see David Woodbury has put uh, pay better wages. Now, construction wages tend to be pretty good, but in a lot of industries, that's definitely the case. So we have definitely been pushing government to create opportunities, but also in the... Uh, uh, lifelong learning category to make sure that we are in constant communication with the trades and with Holland College to make sure that it, the direction that this is going in, that we are producing enough skilled workers to fill those gaps. It's, it's going to be a huge crisis in the future if we don't start planning for it. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Lynn. Yeah, it's kind of ironic. We have we have a lot of jobs needing filling, but uh, the, skill, the skill gap is there, eh? Um, I'm going to uh, go back to Steve. We've got a question from Amy McPherson uh, that is directly for Steve. She asks, is there currently legislation to allow community-owned renewable energy projects, and could a community install wind or solar and be net metered as a group? So that's an interesting why, question. Why would you ask me that? <laughs> well, <laughs> because she's looking for somebody who doesn't know the answer. <laughs> um, well, interestingly enough, the, uh, the, the Minister of Transportation, Infrastructure and Energy tabled some legislation very early on here to allow that, but only for farmers. Um, so when he went over it with me, I told him my only real big criticism of it. There was a few other things about it, but why is it only for farmers? Why isn't it for communities and nonprofits and cooperatives? Why are you excluding those? So uh, I was under the impression from our conversation that he was going to take that back to the drawing board and come right back with it and we were going to get going. But 
it's been sitting there on the uh, on the order paper, sitting on the table since the beginning of uh, since we got elected. Essentially, it was it came out very quickly after we got in there for our first sitting, and it's been just sitting there since. So they have gone out and they've done consultations on the, the Electric Power Act and the Renewable Energy Act, looking for input and finding ways to try to do these kinds of things. Um, that was supposed to have been brought forward this past sitting that just ended in the fall. Uh, but the last time I was speaking with the department about some of my legislation, they let slip that uh, that's probably going to be another year or so before they even uh, go that route. And mm. some of the input I've been getting is, well, that might just be the language they use and they might never get to it. Uh, it's sitting there. It's, it's partly done. Uh, but we're we're not getting as far as we'd like on it, that's hmm. for sure. Okay, so it's in it's in limbo land. <laughs> it's the answer. Limbo land. Limbo it, land it was, right it was going so quickly at first. Now yeah. it's in limbo land. <laughs> okay, um, Ola, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this next one here to you. Um, this is a question that came in about. Uh, uh, here's the question. Without really arguing about sticking with standard or daylight savings time, could you discuss what the Green Party thinks about staying on the same time zone all year round and what the party is going to do next? So I'm not sure if this has been a discussion in caucus at all, and I know that uh, there's a private member's bill that's been put forward uh, to that effect, but um, have you had a chance to kind of discuss that or what, what do you, what's your take? Um, we haven't discussed it in caucus. I have thought about it a little bit. I, I, uh, I suffer as everybody else when I have suddenly to get up an hour earlier in the morning and enjoy when I can sleep an hour longer. Um, on the other end of the year, I, uh, it's obvious. It, it, there was a motion put forward in the legislature, and it basically passed to look into it. But as uh, the premier said, well, obviously. It has to be made in conjunction with the other Atlantic provinces, or it doesn't make any sense. It's it's obviously need to be a cooperative effort to make it work. But mm -hmm. I th I think it's a good idea to abandon it. Uh, you know, the question whether you move the uh, move the hour forward all year or or stick with the actual astronomical noon. You know, that's another detail, but. The first thing is to get a cooperative effort between the Atlantic. It doesn't make any sense that the time zone, time zone could change if we cross the bridge. Okay. Is there uh, anybody else want to say anything about that? Uh, or um, is that pretty much where we're at is waiting for indications that we might get, go together with the other Atlantic provinces? I see Steve's hand. Steve? Yeah, all I just I just wanted to add that this has been a thorn in my side for many, ever since I learned that it, this was actually killing people. Like uh, every year we have deaths that occur for this thing that, and I could never ever find any benefit to it whatsoever, but I did see that people are actually literally dying of it and we still carry on with it. So, um, and the other thing I'll throw in is it should be standard time. Okay, thank you, uh, Steve. Um, I've got uh, a question here um, from Ruth DeLong, and she she was wondering about, uh, this is something that I, I know that I, I get questions about <laughs> people writing into the Green Party, and I'm sure the rest of the caucus does, maybe especially Lynn. Um, she's saying that there's an issue with, uh, with lots of dirt roads and silt flowing uh, into streams and creeks. And she's wondering if there's more uh, proactive solutions that can be implemented to stop this runoff. She says that the watersheds do such wonderful work on trying to get silt out of the streams, but poor practices along some of the dirt roads make it a losing battle. Is this something that you've been hearing about, Lynn? Yeah, absolutely. Here's the thing. This is one of those incredibly difficult topics because a lot of the types of solutions that are proposed by people would have really specific um, restrictions for people's property and you just don't have the ability to to legislate what people do with their tree lines for example to help prevent some of this you can't mandate that people keep trees in place 
it's definitely complicated. I find that my conversations on this usually start with the watershed groups. And in a lot of cases, it's more um, something has happened. There's been a disturbance of some kind, whether it's the Department of Transportation sent someone in to do a little bit of work and the watershed group has said, you know, what would really make a difference is if we knew this was going to happen ahead of time. So we could prepare the area, we could put down straw, we could put up nets to catch the silt. We could do this if we were just given a heads up that this project was going to be going ahead. So in any set of circumstance where there's a, a disturbance or if there's going to be a change in the road area, even if it's as simple as a culvert, I think a very easy solution is to have a more proactive relationship with the watershed groups. When the problem is coming from a field in the area, I think there are a number of things we can do on that. Uh, we could go into this for quite some time, but often it revolves around things like mandatory crop, crop covering, things like this. Mm. But when we are in situations where it's plainly just a road, there's been no disturbance and it's being fed into from surrounding property, it's really hard to create policies that would prevent that because it would put such a an onus of responsibility on people's property. Yeah, it, it's hard to navigate. Wow, okay. I, I didn't know that that was such a, well, I could see how it would be a thorny issue <laughs> to legislate yeah, what people can do with trees and, and things like that on their property, but uh, I didn't know that it was that, that difficult. It would absolutely be a, untenable to tell people they cannot cut down trees on their property or that they need an approval permit for it. So it certainly makes it yeah. complicated. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I've got a question here for Carla from uh, Maureen Kerr. And Maureen says that she is concerned about the water quality in schools on PEI. She says there's a number that have shown pesticide levels that are over the allowable limit. Do the schools have filters in fountains? Are you able to answer that question, Carla? So um, I know that the, you know, I was at my kids, my youngest son's um, school today. I do breakfast program there on Mondays and they've got bags over their fountains. But the funny thing is, is that the fountains are original to the school that was built. I don't even know what year, but they're the old white fountains that have no water pressure whatsoever. And so I know that there's no uh, filter on those fountains. On the newer, I guess they're more water bottle filling stations that, that a lot of schools are getting, especially uh, through COVID. I know that a lot of schools, um, there were a couple of community organizations pushing to help schools put those in to help kids fill their water bottles. And those do have filter systems in them. Um, I'm trying to think that question came up before. I can't remember if Maureen and I, if, if we've talked about that before or if someone else brought that to my attention too. That is something that um, I will look into in terms, I'm not sure what even they would do for, you know, regular water tests. I know for the air quality, as, Lynn, do you know more about that? I know okay. a little bit about that, Carla. I can say that uh, I had this question come up and I reached out to the Department of Environment and there's an awful lot that they don't test for in the water, unfortunately. They feel like it's within the limits. They don't use any sort of a filter for pesticides. Uh, they don't use a filter for nitrogen, excuse me, for nitrites as far as I'm aware. I have uh, quite a lot of that information from the department that I could forward on. If anyone wants to just private message me, I can send you the response. But the, the short answer is no, they're not testing for that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go over to another question, which I think Steve might wanna answer because he mentioned this earlier. Um, how will the Green Party slash official opposition work to promote the adoption of proportional representation, open list mixed member PR in the near future? It seems that if collaborative government is truly going to work, then the electorate needs to understand that the legislature should reflect the percentages of the population desiring representation by particular parties. I absolutely agree. And that's why I was so determined to get that line of questions into the premier on the plebiscite and what a plebiscite was to him and 
because did the referendum offer a definitive yes or no? And the answer is no, it did not. Um, the plebiscite did have a definitive answer and it's the expressed will of the people. And I bumped into the premier in the hallway, uh, probably about half an hour after I asked the question to the legislature. We had a couple of minute chat about uh, what was going on and, and proportional representation in particular, not just uh, electoral reform, uh, but proportional representation and why it was so important to protect our democratic system. Now that we have more than two parties, you could have, <laughs> and this is not nothing bad with the Green Party whatsoever, but you could have a party suddenly rise to power and uh, take over uh, in our existing system. And the more parties that join the, the, the show, the more likely that is to happen someday. And it could be a, a very upstart populist party. And uh, he absolutely agreed. He said, we need to do something about it. You're right. And let's continue this conversation. So the line of questions opened up the door to have that conversation. And it's something that's been a, a big passion of mine. The, the reason that I got into politics, uh, you might think it's about electric vehicles or renewable energy, but it was when my MLA, Tina Mundy, stood up and voted as a block to uh, ignore the results of the original plebiscite. So that was what kicked me into politics. So you can, I can guarantee you it's not going to drop off my agenda completely. But kind of felt like right after the, uh, the election, when we had the referendum, wasn't the time to press it any further because people had probably heard enough for the moment. But now it's kind of back on my radar. So that's what I got for you. Okay. Anybody else want to speak to that? Okay, I will just move. Quick. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sorry, Jordan. I was just going to throw this out there really quick. And Steve, I missed the first part of your answer. So if I'm repeating this, I do apologize. One of the things that we said when we were we were first in, because you know people were following up with us right away uh, as soon as we were elected to say, you know, what what are you doing with electoral reform? And, and just like Steve said, we had decided that, you know, for at least a little while, it would be something that we would just put to the side, not forget about at all, but put to the side for now. And, and we thought, let's let um, what the, a normal turnout or a normal um, result of, a, of um, you know, having a minority government, let's let this play out and see, you know, to show Islanders kind of a real taste of what electoral reform could look like and what uh, what governments could look like and so um to steve's point it's perfect timing now hey thank you um now i've got uh there are a couple different people um including maureen kerr here who was wondering about the status of an environmental bill of rights and whether you can give us a preview of what a concept of an environmental bill of rights would look like or what it would be. Um, are you able to speak to that one? Yeah, that's my bill. Um, that's so exciting. So I have been working on an environmental bill of rights. And if everything goes well, I would love to have it ready to present in February. I don't know how likely that is, because I am consulting widely on this one. But Environmental bills of rights are such an interesting piece of legislation because it really gets at the root of so many of the environmental issues that we bring forward and, and that are concerns for people. So first and foremost, it guarantees the people of the province the right to a healthy environment and to clean water. That is put in legislation. It also dictates that the government has to create a statement of environmental values. They have to say after consulting with people, what it is we're trying to achieve. It guarantees a certain level of consultation that has to happen on certain projects. There has to be a list maintained. People are aware of what's going on and what the implications are. And if you feel it is in contravention to that statement of values or to your right for an a healthy environment, you have the right to ask for it to be reviewed. You have the right to, um, if going through that review process, you still don't feel you've met the right threshold. You have the right to halt a project. In Ontario, it gives people the right to sue a government if they go forward with a decision that's going to have negative detrimental environmental impacts for people. It's actually quite a, a heavy piece of legislation. It's probably 30 plus pages as I'm going through it now. So it's gonna take a while to get it complete. <sighs> but essentially it would, when you look at issues like the um, pathway that was cut through the sand dune 
or the getting rid of protected land for an overpass, or excuse me, not an overpass, but a turning lane. It, all of these issues, if you got at the core of it, the Environmental Bill of Rights would have prevented these things in the first place. There would have been a, uh, an ability for the public to do more than just sign a petition, but they could actually have some substantive outcomes as a result of it. So I'm in the process of consulting widely on this legislation and depending on what I hear back, I could go in a couple of different directions, but the crux of it, does the Environmental Bill of Rights flow down to municipalities? It should, it would be, um, provincial responsibility entirely. It wouldn't be within the municipalities, but I will have to look at how those two uh, jurisdictions interact in other places. But I can tell you for certain that in Ontario, where they do have an environmental bill of rights, there have been multiple times where people have sued the government and won. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a piece of legislation that has teeth. There are at least three other jurisdictions that have something similar. I would say Ontario's is the most comprehensive, but um, that's the one I'm, I'm looking at as a model right now. But I think it has the potential to have a profound shift in environmental issues on PEI. Great, and just a, a follow-up question of my own, Lynn. So I know in Ontario, they, they have an environmental commissioner who is like an independent officer. They don't anymore. They don't, so they, oh, that was scrapped when, by Doug Ford, right? Oh, right, got it. okay. So when that bill was originally created, it did have an environmental commissioner who oversaw all of this and was responsible for um, implementation. In our proposed piece of legislation as it stands so far, it wouldn't create a new position. It's hard to do that because our bills can't create spending. <laughs> so uh. it's, it's harder. However, we can give that authority to the Auditor General in the same way that she currently, or he, in, yes, it is going forward, we now have a he for our Auditor General. I always say she, excuse me. Um, they would have the ability to go in and, and hold government to account. So even on climate change now, the Auditor General goes in and reviews it and makes recommendations and says, hey, this is where you are not meeting your obligations. So that would go to the Auditor General. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Pleasure. Okay, so I've got a question here next from Kevin Holloway. This doesn't fit into any um, particular portfolio, but it, it uh, pertains to all MLAs. He says he would like to know if there's been any discussion on eliminating the severance package for MLAs that qualify for pension benefits. Uh, he says there was some talk of this before the last election, but he's heard nothing since. The average severance package is around $65,000 and cost, tax pay, cost taxpayers in excess of $700,000 after the last election. Can anybody speak to that? Has it, <laughs> Lynn, sure. I can speak to that if nobody else wants to. Yeah, the way that the uh, severance package is currently calculated, it's um, a month salary. How does that go? A month's salary per month that you served up to a... Or per year that you served, I think, right? Yeah. yeah, for every year that you served. And it's in legislation. It's currently in the um, Legislative Assembly Act, if memory hmm. is correct on that one. I haven't looked at this recently, but I would tell you in 2017, it was before Hannah got elected, right, Jordan? That mm -hmm. Peter had actually asked the Premier of the day about it. Um he had asked Wade because Wade McLaughlin had said they would review it and then never did. He brought it up a number of times. I know that at the time, Peter believed it should go to the Indemnities and Allowance Commission. They are the ones who determine what MLA's salary should be, if there should be raises. MLA should not be governing that themselves. It's just a blatant conflict of interest. It makes so much more sense for the uh, Indemnities and Allowance Commission to have a review of it and possibly lower it, but I don't think that decision should be made by MLAs. I think it should be made by a, a third party that's independent. I don't know if any of yeah. my colleagues would like to add to that, but it seems to me that that was still something that Peter had brought up even recently, the need to uh, have the Indemnities and Allowance Commission take that over so that uh, MLAs stop deciding their own severance. Okay, thank you very much. Carla, did you have something to add to that? Well, I was, I'm just noticing Michelle and I'm wondering if Michelle has, has something that, uh, 
Oh yeah, we've got Mich Michelle's a little uh, yeah. guest uh, observer mm -hmm. here. She's our <laughs> finance critic, so she might know more about that. Well, all I can say is Lynn's right. So it's a it's one month for every year served to a maximum of 12 years. So to a maximum of one year um, severance. And that is whether you, um, you lose in an election or you don't reoffer. And, um, and there is movement, I believe the legislative that there is through, um, through one of the committees, the um, recommendations and possibly legislation coming forward shortly. Um, I think it was supposed to come forward this elect this uh, sitting, but then there was um, there was issues with it. So there, I believe, the next sitting that there's supposed to be something coming forward. Okay, thanks for the update on that, Michelle. So uh, I've got another question here from uh, Rita Jackson. She says, "Food security goes hand in hand with poverty, poor health, and poor school outcomes." What are you doing about food insecurity on the food island? Anybody feel like they want to tackle that? Carla, do you want to speak to that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it the first go. Um, that's actually something that um, during the um, during the last lockdown, I was it was just driving me crazy as I considered the fact that. You know, I was worried about um, all of our kids and that usually would get lunch at school and they weren't getting lunch. And uh, so I was talking to Brad Trivers and suggested that he continue the lunch program throughout COVID. And so he did. <laughs> um, so um, as we consider the fact, like you said, we are on the food island, there are so many things that we could be doing to ensure that we have reliable supply chains and that you know, that we're able to take care of ourselves um, in any sort of natural disaster or pandemic or whatever, whatever it be. So I've, I've been looking at pieces of legislation that have been tabled and never discussed and, and started to come up with a bit of a um, bit of a, a position on that just I haven't shared it yet with anyone but it but it is something that that I think about quite a bit. And uh, I know that 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 Lynn will have a lot to add to that. Lynn, did you want to add something so, to that? Well, I, I look forward to having that discussion with Carla for sure. However, I think one of the really uh, formative things was the school food. I think that's incredibly important. But fundamentally, we need to be doing something about how many people are living in poverty. And I was so excited with the recommendations that came from the Special Committee on Poverty that recognize we need uh, food basket measures to be brought in. We need a basic income that is accessible to everyone on PEI. Um, 18 years and older, I believe, is how that was put forward. We need to genuinely get to the, the root cause of this, and the root cause is not having enough money. So I, I think that school food programs are so important to fill that gap. I think there are a number of things, making sure that we do a good job of servicing food banks and, and looking at possibilities to uh, get excess from a farm to people who need it. Looking at all of the ways we can marry those things is so important, but fundamentally we will never address this issue unless we address poverty. And I thought that the recommendations that came forward from Hannah and, uh, and Trish were spot on on this. They did incredible work to get those recommendations. And I think we need to now hold their feet to the fire and get that pilot underway. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. And I think we can squeeze in uh, one more. We've, we've actually made very good progress with our, our questions. There's a few that uh, we'll, we'll follow up with, um, uh, we'll follow up on in, in writing. Um, but another one from Maureen Kerr, she directs it to you, Lynn, but I'm not sure maybe others have something to say about this. She says that she's heard that our government is recruiting immigrant workers to work in the fast food and under other industries. Uh, could you share what this program is? And she says, there seems to be a lot of mystery around it and is wondering if it's true that their wages are being topped up to $25 an hour for jobs like working at McDonald's. Is this something that you're familiar with? I have never even heard of this. So that's so interesting to me. I'm curious if Michelle is familiar with that one. 
No, you're shaking your head. No, I see. This is not something that's ever been brought to my attention. I've never heard of bringing in um, unskilled workers to work in fast food. I, I'm not familiar with that at all. I don't know if they have a, a source they would like to direct me to or a, a link on the website. I'm more than happy to look into it, but not familiar. Yeah, so Maureen, if uh, if you'd like to uh, to share anything more about uh, about where you're you're hearing this, uh, that would be a good thing to uh, to look into some more. So I'm happy to research it if you want to follow that. up with me even privately, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm not currently familiar with that. Okay. Well, we're at eight oh two, so uh, so we've we've gone through uh, an hour. Uh, so thank you very much for everybody who, uh, who sent in questions. Um, this has been really great. And I hope that, uh, that everybody got something out of this. Um, yeah, and it did go fast, Lynn, you're right. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is something that, uh, that we're hoping uh, to do, uh, do again, you know, in the future, um, hopefully not too long from now. And uh, so, so that, you know, cause we know that there's a lot of questions that get pent up and uh, yeah, I'm just, I'll ask the MLAs if there's uh, how, how this went for you. Uh, was there anything that you're taking away from this that you'd like to look into some more or that? Um... Yeah, I'll go first. First of all, I always love when we have an opportunity to have a conversation with the membership and to hear questions. So we'll definitely have to make a point to do this more often. I really enjoy this. Thought it was interesting, some of the discussion around that happened in the chat on the potential to mitigate the harm from dirt roads. So I'm going to do some digging into that. I think that's really interesting. And I will certainly follow up on the, the last question. I'll be curious what others think. Thank you, Lynn. Any any of the other MLAs want to make any closing comments? Go ahead, Ola. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's great. Um, I think we should have have these uh, sessions more often, and I think uh, it would be good to dig into some issues, whether it's uh, food security or net zero or whatever. I mean, you could spend a whole hour to just speak about one of the subjects would be exactly really good to get into it deeper. I'm looking forward to more. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ola. I really enjoyed this as well. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking an hour of your time to to ask these important questions. And uh, so I am going to look more into that water quality. And I feel I I've been kind of identifying my priorities for the next sitting coming up and food security was already on there. So I am feeling pretty uh, pretty validated that, that it needs, well, of course we know it needs to be on there, but I'm really happy that that came up tonight and for all of the discussion and I would love to do these more often as well. Thank you, Carla. Yeah, I'd echo a lot of what Carla just said there, but uh, one of the things I've really taken away from this is that uh, despite the work that we've been doing and the, all of the, the questions we ask and question period and the lives we live and it's so focused for us, we have to do a better job communicating that to uh, all of our supporters out there because a lot of the questions that were asked tonight were things that were already actively in play in legislature and whatnot. So I think this was a good example of how we need better communication channels and thank you very much, Jordan. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I mean, I, I follow you guys as closely as I as I can. And uh, but you know, there's there's so much that happens in the course of a sitting that uh, I just can't keep up. So I, I, you know, this is really great for me as well. Uh, so thank you very much, all of you for uh, your time tonight. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. Take care. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Thank you.